by the 18th century, crops were larger, towns and ports were growing, the power of merchants, manufacturers, lawyers was increasing, and their success nurtured new ideas that would change the world. The Enlightenment and Society, this time on the Western tradition. Now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. It's stupid and absurd to burn people for their ideas, but it's just as stupid to believe that ideas don't matter. Now, when you think that ideas don't matter, you can be tolerant about them, which really means that you're indifferent. Now, the 18th century talked a lot about tolerance, just because tolerance was so rare, and it was rare because then, as today, ideas were likely to have concrete effects on the way society worked, on the way people thought, on the way they lived in society. Now, today, I want to talk mostly about these ideas and their effects. And the first thing to say about them is that whilst many philosophers were noble, 18th century ideas were dominated by the growth of the bourgeoisie in the West, its growing self-confidence and its self-assertion. Behind this advance of the bourgeoisie was an improving economy made possible by bigger and better ships, more canals for heavy transport of goods, more and better roads. You look at 16th century roads and they're largely ruts. By the 18th century, the main highways at least began to look like something we would recognize as a road. Louis XIV had started the improvements because he wanted his troops and tax collectors to get around faster. By the middle of the 18th century, France had a good system of stoned, paved roads radiating out from Paris. Spain and North Italy followed suit. The Germans and Russians tried to copy them. And by the end of the century, a Scotsman named McAdam, who had made his money in America, developed a really decent road surface. Side roads, however, remained primitive. Dust in summer, impassable mud in the winter. Land travel wasn't going to be easy for another hundred years until the railroads came along. But at least, there were bridges now where only fords and ferries had been, and the price of transport was falling, and those who could afford it could now take coaches, a 17th century invention. And this inspired a new kind of pastime for the rich, something we call tourism. The 18th century was an age of travel books, accounts of visits to Paris, to spas, to take the waters and gamble and flirt, to Italy, to see the antiquities, to Venice, which was a favorite pleasure spot, and since tourists have always liked souvenirs, and since there were no cameras, the Venetians developed the first picture postcards for rich visitors, vedute, views, that you could buy and take home and hang up and talk about. The most famous Venetian painters of the 18th century, Canaletto, Bellotto, the Guardi brothers, all these had large workshops that turned out masses of pictures of San Marco and the Grand Canal and other Venetian scenes. 
two of the most popular works of the 18th century were in fact going to masquerade as travel books. The first are the Persian letters of Montesquieu about the impressions of two Persian ambassadors in Paris and it suggests how curious and absurd the commonplaces of one society appear to members of another society which has different customs and takes different things for granted. The Persian letters came out in 1721. A generation later, in 1759, Voltaire's Candide presents a more bitter satire. Candide is about the travels and adventures of an innocent young man, a candid young man, who has been brought up to believe that all is for the best in the best of possible worlds, and who finds that the real world is very different from what the philosophers say. Both books are very funny about very serious matters. More significantly, both are relativistic, which is the effect that travel has on thoughtful minds. And this understanding that attitudes vary with individuals and environments, as Montesquieu makes the point. This notion was an important feature of 18th century thought. And there were other signs of progress. Farming technology improved. Agriculture became more productive. Fewer crops were destroyed by armies and they were better stored. So there was more food, more people stayed alive and the population grew. Most people still lived off the land but a healthy agriculture meant a healthy economy in general, more exchange, more buying power, more manufacturers, growing towns, growing ports, and the growing power of merchants, ship owners, financiers, and the lawyers who drew up their contracts. All this happened first in England because England was spared the worst of the wars that pumped resources out of the continental states. She also had important resources of her own access to cotton, lots of native wool, the water power to turn textile mills, iron and coal to feed the forges and smelt the iron. And England had Scotland, which was a backward country full of forward-looking men. MacAdam came from Scotland, so did James Watt, who gave us the steam engine, when Voltaire went to England, he marveled at what he found. Trade has made them rich, it has helped to make them free. Freedom, in turn, has spread trade further. The greatness of the state is based on this. Voltaire put the ideal clearly. Trade makes wealth, wealth favors freedom, freedom favors trade, trade favors a country's greatness. That's what he wanted to see in France, that's what the bourgeois wanted to see everywhere, and those bourgeois who achieved economic power were now also going to claim political power. By the end of the century, one leader of the French Revolution made this very clear. A new distribution of wealth, he said, calls for a new distribution of power. Now, you have to be careful how you use the word bourgeois because the term covers a multitude of sins or at least a multitude of pursuits. Some bourgeois were businessmen, some were craftsmen, state employees, public servants, lawyers, financiers, manufacturers, and some were men of letters. Intellectuals a term that didn't appear until the 19th century, although it was in the 18th century that writing became a profession. So there were different kinds of bourgeois, but they shared common ideas. And this common point of view, which we might call a bourgeois philosophy, didn't present itself as just bourgeois, but as a universal philosophy, something that applied to all mankind. 
When we talk about human rights today, we are using the language and expressing the principles of the 18th century bourgeoisie who talked about liberty and progress and man and who eventually wrote documents like this one, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, issued in France in 1789. And this was a fundamental change which would again be stressed by American and French revolutionaries who appealed not to the special rights or characteristics of Americans or Frenchmen, but to the nature and the rights of man, which are universally valid. And if I keep saying man, you will understand that it is because this is what the men of this time used. This was very different from what was going to happen later in the 19th century when the proletariat, the working class, was defined as an independent entity and workers were invited to adopt a proletarian, a class doctrine that was much narrower. But in the 18th century, the bourgeoisie identified its cause with the cause of all humanity. They were bourgeois, but they considered themselves simply as human and the interests they pursued were not, as they saw it, class interests, but valid for everybody. So that today when you talk about human rights, you are expressing the principles of the 18th century bourgeoisie. This universalization of specific principles and interests was going to encourage a hypocritical pretense that what was good for the bourgeois was good for everybody. But it was also going to inspire and to justify the demand that what is done to improve the lot of the bourgeois should be done to improve the lot of everybody. And this is another principle that still affects our politics today. Another novel and important aspect of the time was that these enlightened ideas were going to be more swiftly and more widely publicized than ideas had ever been publicized before or ever could have been. This, for instance, is a French caricature of the three social orders with the commoners on top. Not that propaganda, the systematic effort to persuade, was an 18th century invention, it had always existed, but mass advocacy, at least of a secular kind, only came with the better communications and exchanges of the 18th century, with broadsheets, gazettes, newspapers, and clubs, with more books and pamphlets than ever before, with drawing rooms, cafes, debating societies, and secret societies. The most important of these secret societies were probably the Masonic lodges. They had started in 17th century England, but they were spread all over 18th century Europe by the French, who counted over 30,000 brothers. Most of the great philosophers were Masons, like Voltaire and Diderot. But also aristocrats like the king's cousin, the Duke of Orléans. And a lot of foreigners, Frederick the Great, Mozart, Washington, Franklin. As a matter of fact, if you look at the medallions on the back of our dollar bill, you'll find that one of them is a Masonic symbol. The first principle of Freemasonry was a cult of humanity. This didn't challenge the power of kings, but it did challenge the dogmas of established religion. The Mason believed in God, but not in any particular God, not in the God of any particular church or revelation, and the Mason believed in reason and in the natural religion only reason could reveal, so he wasn't impressed by religious rituals, he had his own 
which we call deism. More immediately important, Masonic societies added to the number of clubs which spread the progressive ideas of Paris through the provinces, which provided a sort of capillary system for the new ideas to seep into the attitudes of the upper and middle classes. And along with ideas, the vocabulary changed radically. This is the time when the word social turns from sociability to society and it acquires its present meaning as in sociology, as in social sciences. Now, this is when words like capitalist appear, when nation and national acquire their modern sense. And this is when terms like people or populace shed their pejorative sense as in the common people, the vile populace. And they become, as the Encyclopedia of Diderot and Voltaire puts it, the most numerous and necessary part of the nation. This transformation of the, of the vocabulary is a sign that ideas are changing and changing profoundly. A few words dominate the century. Nature happiness, virtue, reason, progress. Now, these words are not new and they do not mean the same thing for everybody, but there is nevertheless a spirit of the times, a broad agreement on certain basic notions. It was assumed that through reason and science, people could understand nature and harmonize with its laws, thus progressing towards happiness and perfection. But first they had to know about nature and the nature of nature, what nature is like. And this natural science was based on the discoveries of the 17th century, which had a far greater effect on the thought of the 18th century than on its own time. The 17th century was the great age of scientific discovery. There were the new instruments that made discovery possible, the telescope perfected by Galileo, who also invented the thermometer and greatly improved the mechanical clock. While a pupil of Galileo's, Torricelli, invented the barometer. All of these instruments permitted more exact and more extensive observations. Then there were specific discoveries. William Harvey discovered the circulation of the blood through heart and lungs. Anton Leeuwenhoek developed lenses powerful enough to see bacteria and spermatozoa. Robert Boyle worked on the behavior of gases at different temperatures and under different pressures and became the father of modern chemistry. Tremendous advances were made in mathematics by Isaac Newton and René Descartes. Advances in logarithms, differential calculus, integral calculus, all laying the groundwork of higher mathematics and the mysteries of electricity and magnetism were being revealed by William Gilbert and Benjamin Franklin by way of Italians like Alessandro Volta and Luigi Galvani. But the greatest figure in early modern science was Isaac Newton, who lived from 1643 to 1727. Newton laid the groundwork of modern physics by working out the mechanical laws of motion and especially the law of gravity, the speed with which bodies descend to Earth. And the result of this accumulation of discoveries was a radical change in the outlook of educated people. When the 17th century opened, serious scientists might still believe in witches. 
When the 17th century closed, this would have been impossible because no scientist believed in the supernatural forces that witches were supposed to dabble in. In Shakespeare's time, people believed that comets were portents. After Newton, they knew that Newton and Halley had calculated the movement of certain comets and that stars obeyed the laws of gravity just as planets did. So now human imagination accepted scientific law and began to reject magic and sorcery. As this book suggests, the mysteries of nature were to be unraveled by humans. In 1600, men had lived in the Middle Ages. By 1700, the mental outlook of educated people was modern. There weren't many educated people in 1700, but their number was growing along with schools and books and propaganda and debate. And as the news of scientific discoveries spread on the continent, it also affected their religious belief. You mustn't think that 17th century scientists wanted to shake anybody's religious belief. Newton himself was profoundly religious and a bit of an alchemist as well. But his discoveries took on a life of their own. After Newton, educated people knew that the solar system was kept going by its own momentum and its own laws. The Newtonian solar system rotated like clockwork according to the law of gravity. Maybe God had set the mechanism to work. Maybe God had decreed the law of gravity. But once it started, he wasn't needed anymore. And so, to some, God became a figurehead, a kind of constitutional monarch. A creator, indeed, but with no right to intervene in a universe that worked automatically according to the laws of physics and mechanics. You could still believe that the starry heavens proclaimed the glory of God. But the way the starry heavens worked was revealed by astronomical calculations. By the 18th century, the great discoveries of the 17th were digested and their implications drawn. Important medical advances were being made in fighting scurvy and especially smallpox. In 1783, two Frenchmen, the brothers Montgolfier, demonstrated their discovery that heated gas inside a fabric bag would cause it to rise. The Montgolfiers went to Versailles, and while the king watched, they sent up a large balloon carrying a sheep, a rooster, and a duck. A couple of months later, the first manned flight sailed over Paris, and by 1785, an American and a Frenchman had flown across the English Channel. The possibilities of science were obviously infinite, no wonder that everybody who was anybody dabbled in it. Voltaire studied mathematics and brought Newton to the general public. Another encyclopedist, d'Alembert, produced vulgarizations of science and philosophy for fashionable ladies. Diderot did chemical and anatomical experiments. And biology fascinated everybody. This is a sketch of Galvani's experiments with frog legs and electricity. So now we're in a world of science, of mechanics, a material world which it's important to exploit, to develop, in order to make people better and better off, in order to make them happy which is itself a novel notion. Aquinas hadn't talked much about happiness. Hobbes and Locke had hardly talked about happiness. But in the 18th century, people hardly ever stopped talking about happiness. This had a great deal to do 
with the relaxation of religious restraints, both Catholic and Protestant. And now there was talk about happiness in nature, happiness in fresh air. This is the time when travel and sightseeing uh, and also walking, swimming, mountain climbing are first advocated for fun and profit. Happiness in a natural life. Noble savages are happy. Noble ladies and gentlemen try to go back to nature. And Marie Antoinette, the Queen of France, has a special farm built to see what natural happiness may be like. And above all, happiness in virtue and measure and reason. But there was a force even greater than natural happiness, one that was going to color the subsequent history of Europe and America as well, and that was utility, as we shall see in our next extremely useful program.